Water quality is under pressure in, in the country and we have to try and make inroads in improving water quality. If we're in doubt about is it, is it sort of wet all year or for part of the year, I think we should try and go above and beyond and just, just keep out from that, that water body and um, not plough within three metres of it. Keep fertiliser and sprays out three metres and don't spread organic manures within five metres of it. And that extends to 10 metres on the shoulders of the season within two, me two weeks of the opening and closing period. Protecting our waters is important to all farmers and generally they'll do their best to ensure practical actions are in place on farms each year. However, these required actions as part of cross compliance have moved a little in the past few years. You are listening to the latest episode of The Tillage Edge with me, Michael Hennessy. We would really appreciate it if you could listen, follow and give us a review on Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcast from. As part of the Signpost Farm Meeting in Keepak a few weeks ago, I caught up with Hugh Rooney, an ASAP advisor in Chagas, to discuss how margins are essential to protecting water quality in all farms. I first asked Hugh, what is a buffer margin? A buffer margin is basically an area, it's a no spread area between the edge of the field and uh, the water course or water body. And when you're saying no spread area, what, what things are you talking well, about? Well, you, you treat it differently depending on, on what you're doing. So if there's water in it throughout the year, you, you treat it as a water course. And therefore you cannot plough within three metres of that water course. Okay. Uh, on top of that, you cannot spread fertiliser or um, pesticides within three metres of it. And you can't spread organic manures within five metres of it. Okay, so there's loads, loads of rules and regulations. So if we're then to kind of think about then the types of features people, like is everything, is, is along with every field, is it all the same? Or are we treating different things around different areas of the field differently? Yeah, well, I suppose you, 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 look at the, you look at the field and you, you look at the slope on it. And um, a water course at the bottom of a field is called an intersecting water course. And it's treated slightly different, differently than the, say, drain at the top of the field. Um, if, as I said, if the water course has water in it throughout the year it's treated as a water course and therefore you cannot plough within three metres of it and for that and for late sown or for late harvested crops that's six metres you're supposed to keep out from okay, that so water back, course. Back to, the, to, to this thing about having in, a, in, a, in a, a gripe or a ditch or a dike or a, people have different words for their, around the country so if there's water in it for the entire year it might be flown it might not be flown but there's water in it is that and uh, is there any way of identifying that on the map? Yeah, well, the department will use the term, um, w the maps on OSI, or Ordnance Survey Ireland, at the scale of 1 to 5,000. So if you want to go into the Ordnance Survey uh, website, look up the maps there, at scale as 1 to 5,000. Any uh, watercourses marked with a continuous blue line are what they deem to be the watercourses. And are they also marked out on the, L the department LPIS mar maps as well? Sometimes they might sometimes be... Sometimes they are, Michael, sometimes they aren't. I've, okay. seen, I've seen discrepancies with them, so we cannot rely solely on them. So the key part is going back to the OSI map, really, it goes is back it? to the OSI map. Plus, I think every farmer should, should walk their own land and try and make a call on it. Um, you'll, you'll know the main watercourses, they've got water flowing in them all year, but you may have other drains that have water in them for six months of the year. And I think we should be, we should be treating them as water courses. Okay, as so well. go back on those now for a second. So you were talking about again a, a, a dike or a gripe or a, you know, a ditch to a degree with water in them as part of the year. So obviously it's very wet year this year. An awful lot of drains or those kind of things have a bit of standing water in them more so than flowing water for the most part. You were saying that even though they're not uh, delineated out on an OSI map. What you're saying is that really there should be a should be a um, three metre margin. Yeah, well, I think look, at water quality is under pressure in in the country, and we have to try and make inroads in improving water quality. If we're in doubt about is it is it sort of wet all year or for part of the year, I think we should try and go above and beyond and just just keep out from that that water body, and um, not plough within three metres of it. Keep fertiliser and sprays out three metres and don't spread organic manures within five metres of it. And that extends to 10 metres on the shoulders of the season within two, me two weeks of the opening and closing period. Okay, and you mentioned also something about six metres as well? If you have a late harvested crop like uh, maize or main crop potatoes or beet and you have an intersecting water course at the bottom of a field, you're supposed to keep back with that crop six metres instead of three and that's just to give an extra bit of area where you can maybe park trailers or do a bit of turning on the headlands 
without it getting ploughed up and um, it, it creates a bigger buffer that will soak up nutrient and it's a firmer pad for machinery to, to park on and turn on. Going back at it then, so thinking about the, uh, we talked about this three metre margin that was already there from the, it definitely needed for the uh, fields or for the streams where it's on the OSI map, the blue, the blue line on it, they already have a three metres. Are we talking about six metres out from the three metres or are we talking about three plus three? It's three plus three, Michael, yeah. It's six in total from the top of the bank. All, all these are measured from the top of the bank. Okay, and the, the extra three metres you're talking about for that overall six metres for these late harvested crops, does that have to be sown into grass as well or just left un, unplanted? It could be left in grass, it could be put into uh, barley, or it could be in another crop that, that's earlier harvested and, and that'll you know, create a firm headland uh, for, for machinery turning. In. Or left as fallow. Or left as fallow, yeah. Okay, all right. So there's, a, there, there, there's loads of, uh, I suppose, particular areas in that, but not overly complicated to a degree. I suppose when you're up around an area like here, I just noticed certainly, certainly as, as I was driving in here to the farm, there's an awful lot of ditches and, 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 and that around here. So yeah. probably an awful lot of fields are going to have to have them up up in this part of the world, which are in Clonny, up in Mead. Yeah, and I suppose like these are a little bit complicated, these rules, but you know, if you're in doubt, talk to your advisor. You're, you're going to be seeing your advisor now over the next few weeks, you know, c c completing the base applications, and just make sure that you're you know, on, on site if you do get an inspection. And in terms of those grass margins, Hugh, how are they managed over time? So they're generally put into kind of a grass is probably the best, from a, from a weed control point of view, grass is probably the best place to have them in, in terms of keeps out the bromes and that kind of stuff. Um, so you're going to have um, what, Timothy and Coxwood kind of thing, is that, yeah, that kind of thing yeah. going to put into them? Yeah. So how is that managed over time then? Um, that'll obviously grass up, but you don't want it to become overgrown, so I'd recommend that it be topped once or twice a year. Okay. Just, just to keep just it from keep, getting... Just keep it in check. Okay, in okay. Check, yeah. that, that's fair enough. Um, just the last one to ask you, you, you did manage, mention a little bit about water quality along the way, and obviously this is a part of all of that. And up this part of the world, it's very much heavier ground. Um, probably, I can see some ponds actually as we're looking out here now. Um, probably a bit of overland flow on that. What's the risk of overland flow? Uh, the risk with overland flow on the heavier soils is that it'll bring very small soil particles with it called sediment. And the phosphorus um, fertilizer attaches itself to soil and to the phosphorus sediment. And when that water moves across the ground, gets into the nearest drain, it brings sediment with it and it brings phosphorus with it and that causes clogging up of the, the, the drains and, and, and streams and it brings eutrophication, it brings nutrients into the stream which causes growth of weeds and algal blooms and, and um, Thing, things like that. So the phosphorus is doing the harm, if you like, yeah. more so than the sediment. Does sediment matter? It just happens well, to bring the phosphorus the or sediment, both The sediment in itself is a problem because oh. it, it chokes up you know, the, the, the spawning uh, gravel areas on the streams. So you, you know a silty stream, you can't nearly see the stones on the bottom because it's silted. So it, it causes problems with you know, uh, fish beds and um, spawning areas. And it also brings in the phosphorus, which causes the growth. So it is this, this two problems with, with that. Okay, so on a year like this, then, uh, say a farmer has it three metres in um, and he thinks he's doing a great job, your job is, is, is doing a little bit more, going, kind of going out walking all these, all the, all the farms and have a look to see whether there's, I suppose, other areas or improvements that can be made. You might describe how you might maybe, if you spotted something, you kind of thought there might be a little bit more movement there and you'd like, what, what, what would the farmer do? Yeah, well, I suppose, like, I'll, we'll only be on a certain amount of farms, uh, you know, over, over a given time, but I'd encourage farmers to maybe walk their own um, lands after a, a heavy rainfall event. And you'll see the areas of the fields that flood and you'll see the weak points in your banks and drains where the water's getting into the water course. And that might be maybe the plough went in a bit too far at one point and just created a weak spot in, in, the, in the edge of the drain. Uh, that might need to be bunded up again. You might need to put soil back into that area to stop that direct quick flow of water from the field into the drain. And that would slow down the water, allow the sediment to settle before it gets into the water course. It'll just hold it up for another day or two extra, and um, that will have a huge benefit for, for, for water quality. So as I'm looking out here onto one of the, one of the fields here, just, just beside us, there's a great big pond of water in, in, in the middle of it. Now, a lot of farmers would be tempted to, Jesus, can I just not, there's 
dig out the corner of that there and kind of let it off kind of thing so I can dry out and so when it it does dry out I can get in there and, and plow on it. You're suggesting that's not the way to go. Yeah look at them I'd be sympathetic towards farmers <clears throat> I know they don't want water lying in their fields and um, but you know probably the worst thing you can do for water quality is to just dig a dig a hole in the side of the drain and, and let it off quickly because as I said that brings sediment and phosphorus and um, and take, takes the soil and silt off your field as well so um, no, if if we could help that, uh, if possible, that's that would do. It. But in 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 that kind of context, that somebody might be thinking, well, if I can get it off the field and into the drain, could I block up the that the kind of the gripe or the drain a little bit and have it in there at least and let the sediment in there and I I can clean that out over time. Is that a solution or not? Uh, look, it, it possibly, but it would want to be well managed, Michael, and 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 overseen by someone you know qualified to do so. Um, it's not something we, we'd be advising farmers to do. Okay, leave it in the field and let it settle yeah. out there. It's the way to go. Okay, Hugh, listen, thanks very much. Um, thanks, Michael. It's going to be a, a, a nice day here, I think, with the. Uh, and there's a good audience kind of uh, uh, milling around here now, so hopefully we'll um, we'll have a good day of it. Thanks very much for your time here. Thanks, Michael. So that's it for this podcast, and my thanks to Hugh for joining me. Join me next week when I catch up with Jim McCarthy to give an update on his farm in Romania. Finally, if you enjoyed the podcast, then recommend it to a friend or colleague, and as always, rate, review, and follow on Apple or Spotify so you never miss an episode. And for more information, go to chagas.ie. I'm Michael Hennessy. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back next week with more tillage news and advice.